This is a code walkthrough for the next portion of the example file Array1DExamples.java. We said this was a rather lengthy file, so we're going to break this up over several code walkthrough videos. So as always, let's start by recompiling the file, and we'll pick back up in this file about this point. So what we'll do is we'll set a breakpoint right about here, under this portion right here, and we'll hit the debug icon and we'll go screaming through the part of the file that we've already executed and we'll pick back up at this point. So because a lot of this is going to take place in the debugger window, let's give ourselves a little more room to see the code and to see the debugger window. And so let's talk about the right way and the wrong way of copying an array. So for starters, let's set up this new array called array copy and we'll create an array of doubles the same size as an existing array, this one called array name. So we will create that and we'll see that this array has zero elements by default. And then what we're going to do is copy this array incorrectly by simply setting these object references equal to each other. So we're just going to say array copy one equals array name thinking that we're copying these values to this array. But in reality what we're doing is we're just setting two array references pointing to the same body of memory, this set of double values in memory. So when we do this, although we do get the same values in this copied array, watch what happens when we set some of the values of, of this array equal to some different values. Notice that the changes are manifested also here in the copy. Watch this. We're going to set this one equal to 42, but this one changed as well. We're going to change it to 34.5 now, and it changes here as we expect, but this array also comes along for the ride. So this means of copying an array by simply doing this is not the way we want to do things. Instead, we want to do it the following way, and we want to create a second copy of this array an array of doubles of the same size as the original array. And then what we want to do in a loop here is loop through all of the array of this one and transfer over the elements of our original array to our copied array. So we're going to loop through this array and transfer these values element by element to here. So we'll just go through that in a loop and we're going to transfer the 34.5 56.7, 29.3, 42.1, and the last value is 56.8. So now this value has copies, true copies, of all of these values. And to prove that this copied array is no longer linked to this one, let's do the same thing we did up here. Let's change some values in this original array and show that these changes don't manifest themselves in this array. So let's make these changes uh, to 78.6, but notice that this one is left unchanged. Let's change this value again to 89.5. We see that this value is unchanged. So this is the correct way of copying an array. Create a new array and transfer the elements over element by element. Next, let's demonstrate how to resize an array. Let's say we want to increase the size of this array by a factor of 4, which is going to make it an array of size 20. So we will get the old size, which is equal to 5, the new size, which is 20. I'm going to give myself a little more room here to see things. Then we'll instantiate a new array to that size of 20, a temp array. I have to keep scrolling down to see this and we're only going to be able to see the first 10 elements of this. But what we're going to do is copy all of the old elements from array name. Actually, we're only going to copy these first five elements over to this array in a loop. So we'll just go through this really quickly by clicking through. And what we're going to do is we're going to swap our array references we're going to say that the array name, array reference, now points to this resized chunk of memory here, which is called temp. And now we're going to null out temp. 
And so now our array name is actually the array of size 20 that we, we resized and we have the original five elements preserved as we see here. In this next example, we're going to demonstrate equality of two arrays. So what we want to do is set up another array called array name 2, which is going to be of the same size. So we're going to click through this pretty quick because it's got 20 elements. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to put our cursor there and run to that point. And now array name 2 has all the same elements as, actually I'm going to collapse a couple of these. Maybe we can see things a little better. There we go. So this is our array name 2, and it's got the same first five elements as this one. So what we want to do is we want to make this array a little bit different than this one, and we'll do that by changing one of the elements there, we've changed the, the 4 element to 57.8 in this one versus 56.8 in this one. These arrays are now different in one element, and our equals instructions should reflect that. So we might imagine this code as being located eventually in some equals method, but what we're going to do is set this equal flag equal to true, and we're going to check the lengths of the two arrays. If they're of different sizes, we know for sure that these arrays are not the same, but of course these arrays are sized the same. So now what we'll do is we'll go through and loop over either one of these arrays, element by element, and we're looking for the first element between the two that differs in any way. Notice that we've got a compound condition here. We're going to loop over the selected array, but only as long as all of the previous elements are already equal to each other. The first time this check fails, as long as one of these elements is not equal to its counterpart, this equal flag will be set false and there will be no point in looping any further. So we're only going to go through this as long as all the elements are equal to each other. So if we start through this, we're checking the first element and it's equal, the second element, the third element, the fourth element, and now we're coming to the third element, the fourth element, the last element, and now as we said this element and this element are different, so this check between the two double values compared to some tolerance is going to fail. The difference is going to exceed that tolerance, so we'll set this flag equal to false, and then when we come back around in our loop again, this part of the compound condition is false, so this entire condition is false, so we are done looping, and the verdict is that these two arrays, even though they are of the same size, are not the same because one element is different. Finally, let's demonstrate how we can use arrays as counters. And let's do this. Let's, let's collapse these arrays that we've got to this point. Give ourselves a little more room there. We're going to do this two different ways. Let's say we want to count up the number of dice rolls. So there's six possible combinations. Let's say we want to check 500 times in a loop. So we're going to set up an array of counts that's equal to the size of the possible outcomes on a dice. So this will be a six length integer array. And we'll set up a random number generator. And we're going to loop on this array. We're going to initialize this explicitly by going through it six times which is just the default, so that didn't really accomplish anything for us. But now we're going to roll the bones 500 times, and we're going to see how many times we get on each dice roll. So rather than clicking through this 500 times, I'm going to place my cursor here and click on this button, which will run to the cursor position. And so this is what we get from rolling the dice 500 times. If statistics held, there should be about 83 for each of these possible rolls. But the point here is that we've got an array of 6 going from 0 to 5. So this is a roll of 1 in the 0 element, a roll of 2 in the 1 element, and so forth. And we will print out all of these outcomes. And we'll look at this a little bit and say, we wonder if there's maybe a little more convenient way 
then putting the dice roll of 1 into the 0 element, dice roll of 2 into the 1 element, and so forth. What if we set up an array that was a little bit bigger of size 7? So we will resize this array, and we will initialize everything explicitly to 0. And now we will roll the dice again 500 times. And rather than doing that, I will put my cursor there and hit this icon to run to that point. And the point here is that now, with this seventh element, if we roll a 1, this random number generator is going to generate a n random number from 0 to 5. We're going to offset that by 1 to get a dice roll. So this is the dice roll. But now, because we've got this array of 7, we can directly update the 1 element with the number of counts of a dice roll of 1. If we roll a 2, we update the 2 element, and so forth and so on. So it's a little more direct. We don't have to do any offsetting this time. So again, let me click here. I'll click this icon. And looks like we've got a little closer to the theoretical expectancy of 83 of each of the outcomes. And again, when we're printing out this time, as compared to last time, when we wanted to extract all of the outcomes, we had to offset the array index by 1 and pull out its value. Now, we can loop from 1 up to 6, and we get the, the roll value directly, as well as the number of times that roll came up. So we don't have to do the offsetting. We're using elements 1 to 6 for the dice rolls 1 to 6. This zero element is a little bit of wasted space, but you know it's a trade-off between memory utilization and a little bit of code efficiency of not having to do that offset every time. So this is covered in the lecture notes. You can take a look at this, but this is just the demonstration of what this looks like in code. So this is just another simple example of an application of using arrays as counters.